when God's power got a hold of him and he became a believer, his life changed forever. And then he had the opportunity to go ahead and to change lives of others forever. The eternal power of God working and changing lives. Now the Sunday Sermon with Lee Farmer, pastor of Cone Baptist Church, Heathsville, Virginia. Open your Bibles, if you would please, today to Acts chapter 9. And we're going to spend some time there talking about the power of change and how lives can be changed through a relationship with the Lord. So today as we're journeying through Scripture, we're still following up, headed towards the day of Pentecost, and we're getting ready for that wonderful story about how the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit comes to earth, and, and now we receive the blessings from a daily journey with the Holy Spirit. But today what I want us to look at is the life-changing power that we can have through a relationship with Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 9, in the first 20 verses, there is such a rich amount of stuff here that you could get sermon after sermon after sermon out of all of this. And I promise I'm only going to preach four this morning, okay? So you can get a lot of sermons out of this material because it is so rich when it talks about the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. You're familiar with the Apostle Paul. We read a lot of his writings in the New Testament. He is most certainly the most prolific writer that we have in the New Testament. And most of us are familiar with his story of how he came to Christ. So today we're going to look at that moment in his life. And we're going to talk about where he came from, what he went through, and how his life changed. But it wasn't just his life. There were believers around him, people who had already put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And they had to stop and take a step back and appreciate what God had done in Saul's life. Because they didn't trust him. And they didn't like him very much. God changed their hearts as well. And so if you'll join me, please, in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, let's go back and look at just this portion of what's happened. If you are at all familiar with the story of the stoning of Stephen, when Stephen was put to death and stoned to death because of his faith and trust in the Lord, because of his willingness to boldly proclaim the word of God, people gathered around and threw stones and killed him. Saul, or the Apostle Paul, later to be known as, stood there and held their coats so he could pick up stones and kill Stephen. Think about that for a minute. He said, here, let me hold your coat. Kill him. He stood there and held the coats of these people who came along and picked up these stones and took this man's life. And then he didn't stop there. Then he wanted to find out from the leaders in the temple if any of the people within their congregation might possibly be a part of this new movement of Jesus Christ. And you see in Scripture it refers to them in verse 2 as people of the way. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you today are people of the way. And so Saul sought them out. He wanted to find people who would dare follow this man named Jesus. And if he found them, he was going to have them imprisoned in Jerusalem. This is the kind of guy we're dealing with. Not a very friendly person at the start, is he? But praise the Lord for the changing power of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? And here's his response in verse 5. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. So immediately in his moment of distress, he's calling out. Who are you? Lord? With a question mark? Isn't that interesting? He is condemning those who believe in the Lord. And now all of a sudden, in his time of need, he's recognizing the possible power of the Lord. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up 
and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. Referred to as the Damascus Road Experience. Saul is going down through there and he is moving towards the Damascus, not because he wants to go and celebrate the power of God. He wants to go and persecute those who believe in Jesus Christ. And in the process of his traveling along the journey, this bright light flashes and the thunderous sound of God's voice come down from Jesus. And it's the power of the Lord in his life. Why are you persecuting me? And he's on the ground and he can't see his eyes are closed. He calls out, who are you, Lord? The people who were around him, Scripture says that they heard something, but they couldn't see what was going on. And when they reached down to pick Saul up from the ground, he couldn't see. He'd been blinded. It says that, verse 9, for three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. Verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. And then we'll stop right there. Because... I always ask you to think about where you fit into this story. Would we have been more like the Saul character? Maybe God needs to do something incredible to get our attention to change our life. Or possibly, if we've been believers for a while, maybe we find ourselves in Ananias' camp. Think about that for a minute. And here's why. Ananias has been told by God directly through this vision, there's a man coming to see you, and this is what I need you to do. This is what I'm, how I want you to to minister to him. And his response in verse 13 is pretty what I think most of us would say. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about him and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call upon your name. That's Ananias' response to a direct word from God. Hold up, Lord. You're sending this guy here named Saul. We know all about him. We know that he is not a faithful follower. We know that all he wants to do is imprison Christians. And you want us to minister to him? You want us to go above and beyond and reach out to this guy who doesn't even like us, who has persecuted Christians? You want us to do this? Verse 15, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. And in most of your Bibles, if you look, there should be go with an exclamation point. It wasn't an option, folks. The Lord got a hold of Ananias and he said, go. How many times when you were younger did you get that proclamation from a parent? Without question, you didn't respond, you didn't back talk, you knew they were serious. I kind of think that's what was going on in Ananias' mind right here. It wasn't a time for him to sit down and try to renegotiate, if you will. This was a parent talking to a child of God saying, go, do what I told you to do. Go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Ananias, is, you know he's got some confusion going on now. Hold up. This is the guy you're calling? This is the guy that you want us to go around and follow and he's going to minister in your name. But then he follows up because he says he will learn to suffer for my name. In verse 17, Ananias went to the house and he entered and placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again, and he got up, and he was baptized. I want you to see how this change took place in Saul's life. 
he goes from standing there watching people kill believers to then traveling to where he can persecute and imprison believers to now all of a sudden finding the power of God in his life in an unexpected place. He wasn't in church, folks, when it came to him. He was on the road showing us that God can reach us anywhere. He was traveling to go and to do something that was not so nice. And yet in this process, God got a hold of him and changed his life. He got his attention. And I love where Scripture says he got up, he could see again, and he followed in baptism, letting the world know that he had declared his love for God. Verse 20, <clears throat> Scripture says that, well, let me back up for just a moment. Verse 19, after taking some food, he regained his strength, and Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. This was their time of discipleship, of mentoring him, of encouraging him as a new believer. And at once he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call his name? And hasn't he come here to take prisoners for the chief priests? So he already had convinced the disciples that he had had change in heart. But now there were people who remember his life before Christ. And they're saying, hold up a minute. Is this the same guy? Is this the same guy who persecuted believers? Is this the same guy who came here with the process of, of imprisoning those who would put their faith and trust in him? He caused all kinds of problems. Is this the same guy? Can you imagine? And yet Scripture says in verse 22 that Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. I love that last part. Even though he came from somewhere else, and even though his intentions were not good, when God's power got a hold of him and he became a believer, his life changed forever. And then he had the opportunity to go ahead and to change lives of others forever. The eternal power of God working and changing lives. You see, in this story, there are two lives that are changed originally. More so when you add the, the followers who came generation after generation. But you see, Saul changed from being a persecutor and a non-believer to becoming one of the greatest defenders of the faith because of what God did in his life. Got his attention in an unorthodox way for sure, but changed his life. And then when Saul allows God to change his life, when Saul becomes a believer and he faithfully begins to follow, he then has the opportunity to not only change people's lives within the disciples' lives, but in the lives of others. Scripture says he became more and more powerful and, and people were amazed at his declaration of the Spirit and the Word of God. And then you have Ananias, who God directly spoke to and said, listen, I'm going to send you somebody, and here's who it is, and, and Ananias knows who he is. He knows that he's a persecutor. He knows he's a problem. He knows he causes trouble for the believers wherever he goes. And yet Ananias' life had to be changed too. His heart had to be changed because he had to get that direct order from God. I know you don't want to do this, but go. Do this. And all of these pieces begin to fall into place. And Ananias goes, and he does exactly as the Lord asked him to do by placing his hands on him and praying for him. And then he gets up, and he can see, and he becomes a believer. And then Scripture says he's discipled there for a few days as the believers pour into him what they've learned from Jesus. And then Paul goes out, Saul goes out, and begins to change lives by preaching the Word of God. I want to encourage you this morning to think about this. In a relationship with Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit has the power to absolutely change us all. Whether we are the worst sinners in history, or maybe we just stumble every once in a while, 10, 15 times a day. God's power is life-changing. And He can change our hearts. Now, 
Think about this. Saul could have gotten up off the ground on the Damascus Road and just dealt with the fact that he lost his eyesight. He could have said, I don't believe all this mess and gone ahead and done whatever he wanted to do. He didn't have to go to the house where he was told to go. He didn't have to spend time there after he got his eyesight back, allowing the disciples to pour into him. He had the ability to choose otherwise. He had free will. But he heard the call and he followed it. And because he did, even today, most theologians think the Apostle Paul is probably one of the greatest apologetics or defenders of the faith that there ever was. And he had an incredible experience with God. He's referred to as one of the apostles, and, but yet he was never physically in the presence of the living Jesus Christ in the human form. The only one of the apostles, the original apostles, who never was there in the presence of the body of Christ while he was living on earth. But because of this experience, because of this experience where the Lord calls out to him directly on that journey, he's considered to be one of the original apostles. God took his life and turned it upside down and changed it for the better. And Saul later gets a Christian name from the other disciples, Paul, and we refer to him often as the Apostle Paul. But he was willing to let God make changes in his life. And wow, what changes did he make? And then Ananias who originally was a little defensive here. Lord, come on now. We know this guy. He's trouble. Go. Yes, Lord. And in his faithfulness, he gets to be a part of this life-changing power of Saul. He gets to witness how the power of the Spirit can change his life. And church, that Spirit is still alive today and changing lives every single day when people come humbly before Him and say, Here I am, Lord. Use me. You talk about the power of changing life. He can do it. No matter our circumstance. I've heard people often say to me, in kind of a joking way, when you invite him to church, oh, preacher, I'd love to come to church there, but I'm afraid the roof will fall in. And I often say to them, it hadn't fallen in on me yet. I've been there, done that. It's not going to fall in on you either. He needs us to come before him, humbly. He needs us to say, Lord, here I am, use me. And I want to assure you this morning, if he can change the life of Saul, What can He do for us in our obedience to Him? He's still changing lives today. And if you're a follower or a believer in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He's still working on you. He's not done with you yet. But you have to be willing to go along with the plan. You have to be willing to be faithful to the call and follow His direction for your life. And when you do, You will bless others, just as Saul did. Because when you faithfully serve the Lord, when you become more Christ-like, you become a blessing for others. You encourage others. You become an example for others so that they too may find that same hope that you have because of your love for the Lord. This morning, I just wanted to encourage all of us to think about the life-changing power of God And to know that through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, He's still changing lives today. No matter what's going on in your circumstance, God can still use you and He'll still still change you. But you got to say, here I am. you got to have that ability to follow as Saul did. You have to do and be willing to respect and follow His leadership as Ananias did. And then know that He's still working on you. Remember that song as a kid? It hadn't been that long ago when we had Miss Lois Nash and her granddaughter sit up here on the stage and sing, He's Still Working on Me to make me what I ought to be. You remember that song as a child? Well, that's what it means to be in a journey with Christ, to know 
that he is still working on us, on you and on me. And I am so thankful to know that in our daily journey with the Holy Spirit, if we'll just let him, he'll do all kinds of amazing things in your life. Would you bow your heads for just a moment, please? When you think about a relationship with Jesus Christ and you think about what he did in the life of Saul, man, if he could do that in Saul's life, what can he do in your life and my life if we just say, Lord, here I am. I'm excited. Use me. Now, he got Saul's attention in a very unorthodox way. And I pray that it doesn't take that to get our attention today. But I'm so thankful that when Saul heard the call, he answered. And I'm so thankful for you today. If your faith and trust is in the Lord, that you answered the call in your life. But he's not through with you yet. He still has a plan for you. He still has work for us to do, church. His power is life-changing. Every day, he can change us. Because as a believer in Jesus Christ, the Word of God says you are a new creature in Christ. Renewed daily in your walk with Him. You are a child of God. And He loves you. Are you willing to follow today? And whatever path He may lead you down, whether you're a new believer as Saul was or whether you're a, a, a grizzled believer as Ananias was. When he says go, exclamation point, are we going? Gracious God, thank you for the opportunity to come today and to worship and to praise your holy name. Thank you for the tremendous story and reminder of the power of change that we can find through the leadership of the Holy Spirit by following, by being humble and faithful to the call placed before us. What an incredible example of taking someone who was an absolute hater of believers in Jesus Christ to becoming one of the greatest defenders of the faith. Lord, help us all to be as faithful, to hear the call and to follow faithfully and humbly, and to know you are still changing lives today. Thank you for that, Father. I ask now, God, as we come to this time of invitation, that you begin to stir and work in our hearts. And if somebody needs to make a decision for you today, Lord, whatever it may be, that they'll just come by after the service and let us pray together and celebrate your working and your power. Thank you, Father, for the great encouragement. Thank you, Father, for Paul's story today. Now lead us in this time of invitation. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray these things. Amen. You've just heard the Sunday Sermon with Lee Farmer, pastor of Cone Baptist Church, Heathsville, Virginia, online at conebaptist.com. That's C-O-A-N-Baptist.com.